This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development, providing graduate level education to working professionals online, on campus, and on site. For more information, please visit study.stanford.edu. All right. Well, today's speaker is Philip Zimmerman, who invented PGP, as I mentioned earlier. And after he developed PGP, it was acquired by Network Appliance. And then they later spun it back out into PGP Corp. And now he's working on voice over IP security. There was a really good interview um, with him in the Mercury News a few weeks ago. And there's a link to that on our website, too, if you're interested in more background information. So please welcome Philip Zimmerman. That was Network Associates, ah. but it's better to get it wrong anyway because they were the dark days of PGP. Thank you. Um, so, um, well, um, these days I'm working on a new project. Um, PGP is kind of, you know, I've been working on that for many years, or actually I haven't worked on it for a while because it's, there's lots of other people working on it. But the new thing uh, is Secure VoIP. Uh, I've been interested in Secure VoIP for actually about 20 years. Um, it wasn't, I was interested in Secure Telephony for 20 years. But 20 years ago, there was no hope of doing anything with it. 10 years ago, though, I did do a Secure VoIP application. It was called PGP Phone. But at that time, um, nobody had broadband at home, and there were no VoIP standards, so it was really not appropriate for that era 10 years ago. Um, many generations of Moore's Law have passed since then. The internet has reached the point now where VoIP is going to replace the public switch telephone network. And so it's time to do it again. Now there's protocols for it. Everyone has broadband. Now we can do VoIP in our pockets with mobile phones. So the time is ripe. Um, so this new project, uh, which I, I couldn't think of a name for it, and somebody suggested Z Phone, and I, I, I really didn't really like the name. And for a couple of years now, I've been hoping someone would sue me for the name and to get to get me to stop using it. But so far, nobody has. Um, so I'm stuck with the name Z Phone. Um, it turns out that there that Z, there was a ZPhone.com in use already, and but it was for I think a retail outlet in one of the Baltic states that sold cell phones. But now, it's, now there's no website there, so maybe I can get it back. Anyway, um, what, what I'm doing now is um, I wanted to come up with a way to <coughs> encrypt VoIP that did not rely on a public key infrastructure. That was easy 10 years ago. There were no public key infrastructures. And I'm using a protocol today that is very much like the one from 10 years ago. Now, since public key infrastructures have not done well, they especially are not going to do well in the VoIP world. Um, they do OK when you have a server and, a, and, and, you know, and web browsers that talk to a server. Um, that seems to have worked out OK. You can get a certificate for the server. But uh, they haven't done well in the email encryption world. Uh, PGP does have a, like, something like a public key infrastructure. But it doesn't look like the centrally managed ones that we see in the X509 world like S-MIME requires. And that's one of the reasons why no one uses S-MIME. There's a great deal of deployment of S-MIME. In fact, the number of S-MIMEs out there that are deployed is actually a lot higher than PGP, and yet no one uses it. No one even knows it's on their computer. They're bundled with Microsoft products, and nobody knows about it. PGP is, is by far the, the most widely used email encryption software in the world. Um, so um, the reason why it's done so well, part of the reason why, is because it doesn't require a PKI to be already in place. Uh, its activation energy is lower. Um, and so I think we can draw some lessons from that. As we move into VoIP, 
we want to get even further away from PKI because you don't need to have persistent keys when you do VoIP, when you want to encrypt VoIP. You do need to have persistent key material for email because you might get an email that's encrypted and you need to decrypt it a week later when you come back from vacation. Or maybe you, maybe you need to decrypt it two years later or 20 years later. You've got to keep those keys around indefinitely as for as long as you want to keep decrypting that encrypted email that's stored in your mailbox. Uh, but phone calls aren't like that. Phone calls are ephemeral. You know, you talk to somebody, you're done talking to them, there's no need to keep any key material around. So if you're not going to have any persistent key material, then, well, you don't need a PKI. Now, um, this means that you could do ephemeral Diffie-Hellman. How many people here know what Diffie-Hellman is? Okay. And how many people don't? How many people didn't want to raise their hand because <laughs> they don't want to admit that they don't? Psychology lecture? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and how many people didn't raise their hand when I asked you if how many people didn't want to admit that? Okay. Keeps on going down, you know, through layers. Um, <clears throat> well, Diffie-Hellman was the first public key algorithm that was invented in 1976. It was even before RSA. And it's well suited for a kind of an ephemeral situation like a phone call. Uh, you don't need to have persistent keys with Diffie-Hellman. In principle, you could make ephemeral RSA keys, but it takes a long time to generate an RSA key. You have to search for primes and whatnot. It doesn't take much time to do Diffie-Hellman in an ephemeral way. So that's uh, perfectly suited for phone calls, and that's what I use. Um, and um, Diffie-Hellman by itself protects communications against uh, passive attackers that are just attackers that are listening to the communications. It doesn't protect against a man-in-the-middle attack, but there are other, there's different ways to do that. When a man-in-the-middle attack means that uh, someone is between you and the other party. So imagine that, um, um, that, imagine that we, we, we buy, excuse me, imagine that we buy a phone at, at Walmart that does VoIP encryption. And it costs $100, and I buy one and you buy one. And uh, um, so now we have these two phones. Now suppose an eavesdropper buys two of these phones at Walmart so they have to spend $200. Um, all they have to do is get in between you and me and arrange the communication channels in such a way they could cut the cables or splice them together or do whatever it is they have to do to make it so that when I try to call you, I pick up the phone and dial you. And instead of dialing you, the phone on the desk of the eavesdropper rings, one of the two phones. And, and they have you on speed dial on the other phone. So as soon as they see it ring with my caller ID, they hit the speed dial for you, and your phone rings. And then they wait for you to answer. And as soon as you answer, he answers my call. Then you take the two handsets, and you put them together like this, like a 69, so that you have this kind of lascivious sort of wiretapping topology here. And there's an air gap between them. And they listen in the air gap to us speaking. No mathematics necessary. They don't have to know a thing about Diffie-Hellman or public key cryptography or any math skills whatsoever. They don't ha need any technical sophistication. They need $200 to go to Walmart. So they could wiretap very easily. A man-in-the-middle attack is very easy to do, at least as far as the crypto is concerned. Um, but how would we tell there was a man-in-the-middle? Well. There is a random session key that we generate each time we do one of these phone calls. And it's random. So the phone call that I make to the man in the middle uses a random session key that is different from the random session key between the man in the middle and you. And if we could somehow become aware of that difference, we would know that there was a man in the middle. So what can we do? Well. We could display on the phones what that key would be, and we could read it aloud and say the key. It's probably not a good idea to speak the key aloud because somebody might overhear us and be able to reconstruct the phone call. So we can hash the key. We can compute a hash, 
and display the hash on the phone and read that aloud with our voices. We just speak it into the, into the telephone. What we're trying to do is we're trying to find an out-of-band method of comparing that, that um, hash of the, of the session key to see if it matches at both ends. If it does match, there's no man in the middle. We have a direct connection. If it does not match, there is a man in the middle. Well, that's what we have to do. That's how you tell. So, no, it's not really a yeah, secret. Well, we don't need, we need an out of band way of comparing it. That's, out of band is actually Yeah. But it doesn't really have to be completely out of band. It could just be speaking with your voice. And if the other person listens to you saying to them on the telephone well, that... Two modalities, basically. Yeah. Orthogonality. You want to have something that the man in the middle can't interfere with. And he can't imitate your voice. Um, yes? The man in the middle is missing the hash function, yeah. No, the function is... The, 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 it could be a public parameter. What, what we do is we take the Diffie-Hellman part that you sent me and the Diffie-Hellman public part that I sent you, and you concatenate them and hash them. So the man in the middle knows exactly what that hash is. It's not a secret. It doesn't have to be a secret. He knows what it is. The problem is he can't control what it is. He can't make it be the value he wants it to be. He can know what it is, but that's all. He has to be able to make it be the same for both of us. Two different hashes, right? You'll have two different hashes. No, we take the, my Diffie-Hellman public, public parameter, which I sent to you, and your Diffie-Hellman public the parameter. The there will be two separate There would hashes. be two. There would be two. The man in the middle would be sending me a Diffie-Hellman public parameter that I would believe came from you, but it wouldn't be the same as the one you sent me. The one you sent me was random and uh, based on a secret random number that you came up with. Uh, he doesn't know that secret random number. He, comes, he, he makes his own secret random number and computes. I mean, it's Diffie-Hellman is the secret random number is x. He computes g to the x, and he sends that. g to the x mod p, he sends that to me. Well, I think it's the g to the x mod p that you sent me, but it's not. It's from the man in the middle. So I take my g to the x and your g to the x, and I concatenate them together, and that makes a hash. And I just check to see, is the hash the same for me as it is for you? It should be the same if there's no man in the middle. But, well, if there is a man in the middle, it's not going to be the same because the public parameter that you sent me, g to the x, never got to me. It went to the man in the middle. He came up, he computed his own random x, computed g to the x, he sent that to me, the different x than your x. So it's not going to be the same. Yeah? Why does he have to do that? Why can't he keep passing the values? He can, he can just keep passing the values, but he won't know the private key that we compute. Uh, this is a projector screen. If this was a whiteboard, I could draw you the formula. If you write on the notepad there, there's a pen and a pad behind you. The notepad? Yeah, they can put the overhead camera directly over Oh, really? Oh, that is so cool. Isn't that cool? <laughs> that's that's even better. And look at this. This is probably paper, it's, right? It's real paper. Okay, can you do that trick now? Can you aim the camera right here? Okay, do we have somebody to do that? Is there somebody in charge of the cameras here? Can you do that? It's just like I think he's trying. He's holding up a finger. Which finger? Just right. Okay. He'll just wait one minute. All right. Oh, now we got camera. We got curtains moving. That's that's a start. Coming. We got to get from there to some optics, right? We got too many lights. Can we kill the lights? That's a blackboard behind you. Oh, there is? A blackboard works. That's low tech. <laughs> can, we, can we just do it on the blackboard? All right. So there's a way to get the overhead camera on the pad. All right, I, I come up with a random X, and you come up with a random Y. Here we go. It's on. Just have to Where is it? Aim your paper. Move your paper. Hey, here we go. Right here. There we go. Hey, all right. So I, could, I have a random X and you have a random Y. It's secret. I don't tell you my X and you don't tell me your Y. But there's a public parameter G that I compute G to the X. You know what G is and so do I. And I send it to you. And you take G to the Y and you send it to me. Okay? It's actually G to the X mod P, which is a large prime number. 
But I, let's not say mod p every time. It takes too long. Okay, it's, you send me g to the y, I send you g to the x. So I compute, I take your g to the y and I raise it to the x power, which is equal to g to the x, y. Now implicit is everything is mod p here. You take my g to the x I sent you, you raise it to the y power, and it's equal to, guess what, g to the x, y. And we use that as a session key for our favorite block cipher, whatever that happens to be, maybe the advanced encryption standard. Yes? But, but are you saying that's uh, happening for every bit of no, the device? No, you do it at the beginning of the call. Once you compute g to the x, y, that's your AES key, your advanced encryption standard key. You, well, why can't the man in the middle just pass both values? And then he can. Them? He could pass both values, but he won't know g to the x, y. He knows g to the x and he knows g to the y. He does not know g to the x, y. But now that you've authenticated, he can just keep listening like using the low-tech method. You were he doesn't know x. He doesn't know y. He knows g to the x. He knows g to the y. He doesn't know x and he doesn't know y. If he doesn't know x or y, he can't compute g to the x, y. No, no, I assume that's correct. But now that the conversation has begun, can he just keep doing the Walmart method you were talking about earlier? Yeah, yeah but, uh, but it won't be the same key. Oh, it already makes sense an, that the key is wrong, and it, it won't, you can't eavesdrop. No, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought you meant. I thought you meant if he if he just passed the the Diffie Hellman through. Oh, if he doesn't pass the Diffie Hellman through, if he does what I described, yeah. which is that he acts as a Diffie Hellman endpoint for right. both of us, right. then there's two different Diffie Hellman agreements, and two different session keys, and he can then hold the phones up to each other and listen in on the air gap. Right. But you asked the question, how, you know, could he avoid us detecting the, the, the uh, you know, could he make it so the hashes would be the same? And I'm answering you by saying, no, he cannot make it the hashes be the same, because in order to do that, he would have to just not generate any Diffie-Hellman parameters of his own, but merely pass them through. And he, if he passes them through, he'll never be able to get the, uh, the session key. He won't be able to listen to our call. It'll be white noise to him. Oh, okay, because his ears are, need that key to listen. His phone right. has to reach a key agreement with my phone. Right. His other phone has to reach a key agreement with your phone. So then there are two key agreements. One between me and him, he's got two phones, remember, and the other one between his other phone and you. And then he puts the two phone handsets together in a 69, and he can listen in the air gap. And we wouldn't know the difference unless we compared the hashes to see if the session keys were the same. If the session keys were the same, that means he, he, he doesn't exist. But if they are not the same, it means there's a man in the middle doing the maneuver that I just described. So basically, in other words, his, your phone's set right? His what? phones have to compute this, this session key. He's in the middle right. computing Z. He's got a secret value Z. He computes G to the Z. He sends me his G to the Z. I think it's your G to the Y, but I'm mistaken. It isn't your G to the Y, it's his G to the Z. He sends you his G to the Z. Maybe he's got two Zs, a G to the Z prime. And so then, then you got over here G to the X, Z. Or no, g to, the, g to the y, z, and over here you've got g to the x, z, which are different. No, no, I agree. I'm just saying it's his, the hardware, his phone, doing that. Yeah, it's his hardware. Right. His, he bought it at, at Walmart. He has no idea what diffie Hellman is. He knows nothing of mathematics. He never graduated from high school. He's a crook. That's why he does this for a living. He steals cars, breaks windows, you know, hangs out with the wrong crowd. But he got $200, probably from selling drugs or something. He goes down to Walmart, buys these two phones, hooks them up like this to try to make some real money. No, but it would be just as effective to an educated hacker, I mean, unless he can crack the phone. You don't have to, this has right. got nothing to do with cracking any phones. He doesn't know anything about how to crack a phone. You can't, you, you can't crack the phone. This is, these two phones are perfectly well-made phones. But he doesn't have access to my phone. He doesn't have access to your phone. He just bought a couple of other phones that are similar to our phones. Yeah? The piece that you said earlier on about this scenario, 
was that you and the other guy at the other end exchange uh, some information, a derivation of the keys, um, by talking or, or however, and that the guy in the middle uh, cannot uh, emulate the voices. Yes, I said that. Was that relevant? Yes, yes, it's relevant because our objective is simply to compare our session keys. We want to know, do we have the same session keys or do we have different session keys? That's really the fundamental question. That's how you tell if there's a man in the middle. If you don't have the same session key, there is a man in the middle. And we'd like to know, so do our the, session keys match? You're missing the important point that you two know each other so you recognize each other's voices. And don't have to know each other. Sure, because otherwise you don't have the authentication. No, no you don't. No, no. that's absolutely essential. You could talk, no, no, listen, hear me out. You call someone you've never heard of before in your life. And you want to talk to them about something important. Obviously, there's a secret involved because you want it to be encrypted. Maybe you want to overthrow the government or make a big deal. So you're going to talk to them for 10 minutes. When you speak these digits aloud to compare, you want to make sure that when you hear him speaking the digits to you, it's the same voice as the rest of the conversation, even though you've never talked to That's him right. before. But what you haven't done is authenticated that the person you're talking to is the person you meant to talk to. And Don't. That's what the, well, if, that's, that's what you do by social interaction with the rest of the conversation. I mean, that's beyond the scope of this problem. You could be talking to somebody in Russia, and you think you're talking to somebody at your bank. This so, is beyond the scope of, what we're tr of the problem we're trying to solve. We're not trying to so stop you from talking to the wrong people. You're going to have to use your common sense to know that your call was not routed to um, Russia. I think actually the voice authentication is a critical part of doing it in this particular application. I think in other applications, you're right, but I think this particular application, at least every time I talk to Diffie, and we exchange the diffie Hellman keys over the, the plus, it's that I know Witt's voice. But it doesn't have to be, you've, you could be talking to Wit and you've never heard his voice before. And that's because what you're requiring is that the voice that says the number or what has to be the same voice the as same all the rest of the call. And so that leads immediately to the question, since this is not an audit, since it's, it's a session that does not do formal authentication, but rather context-based authentication, it leads to the question of having a permanent simultaneous translation not between languages, but between oh, speakers. In other words, somebody could be, the man in the middle could be continuously mimicking the entire call in a different voice. Mm -hmm. And that's the threat model you're outlining? Right. You're right. They could do that. <laughs> but, you know, Touch for pauses. <laughs> um, you know, okay. You know, you, and you could, you I, I'm not that. trying to solve that threat model, and I don't care about that threat model, okay? <laughs> Um, you know, probably if you're going to talk about secret stuff, you probably know the person, or else it wouldn't be secret stuff. Because you don't talk to people, strangers about secret stuff. Now, if you are talking to somebody that you haven't talked to before about something important, you probably have other ways of making sure you get connected to the right person. There might be something in the signaling layer that makes sure you get connected to the right person. The, the SIP signaling might have some kind of authentication mechanisms to make sure that you get the call connected to the right person. You know, there are, there are mechanisms in signaling, in the various signaling protocols, SIP being one of them, H323 being another, or the phone company routing the call correctly. It, you know, that's how you can be sure you're connected. There might be, in fact, there might be cryptographic mechanisms in that. There might be uh, digital signatures in that. Uh, you might be, you might have it, there might be something that digitally signs your SIP address or something like that. But that's another problem. The routing of the call is another problem. Um, I, I think we might be getting stuck in a bit of a rat hole. So if you want to continue with your flow. Yeah. I think that, um, that for people that know each other that want to talk on the phone and talk about secret stuff, this is a really good way to do it. Yes? I'm assuming that will keep the thug out of the conversation, but will it keep the U.S. government out of the conversation? 
It they, would. They already, they already had a hand in building that phone that you bought at Walmart. If I'm talking to someone that I know about secret stuff, the government will not be able to wiretap this. Unless they have a backdoor in the phones themselves, which will expose the key to them. Oh, sure. Right. Yeah. Yes. So, how, what, so, so how buy the have... phone from me. <laughs> okay. Well, I trust you, but do I trust Skype? Do I trust... No. Just so buy it from me. I'm in the business. I will be selling phones like this. I'm going to make money selling phones like this. And <laughs> but in this case, if you, even if you don't trust Skype, <clears throat> Skype is bad. They're just the carrier of the bits. And they can't do any better than the man in the middle at, at defeating this scheme, right? I mean, Well, they also provide the software. So it could be badly implemented or something like that. The question is whether... But all the software, the software could have a back door in it. Any but software you get from anyone could have a back door no, in it. That, I publish my source code to make sure that you can compile it yourself and make sure there's no back door. I understand. But, 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 and if I'm buying the phone from you, then, 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 then Skype doesn't have a back door. Right. I could feel that Skype doesn't have a back door in the phone. My point is, is that if you built the phone correctly to what you're talking about, I would think that Skype, no matter how nefarious they might be, they're just seeing bits go by. They can't really access Well, this it, right? is not a Skype phone. Skype uses a proprietary protocol that they don't publish. All right, any voice over IP. Yeah. I mean, the carrier itself. The carrier will not have a way of getting into this. Yeah. yeah. My point is that Skype does something like this. In fact, let's assume that the, that, the, uh, that the channel is operated by the, the NSA. Let's say they own all the wires, the okay. fiber optics, the switches, the routers. Not only are they surreptitiously debugging it, they actually own the equipment. It's actually in Fort Meade, and they advertise saying, we give you a cheaper rate than Sprint, you know. <laughs> and, and, you know, with the NSA, you know we're going to keep it running all the time, you know. Uh, and, so, and so I would feel very comfortable about using their, okay. using their network uh, with this kind of phone. Yeah. This is really your problem definition. I don't know this will help you um, to your next point, which is while all this encryption is going on, why not um, just do it the way other computer security is being done, via like an SSH tunnel? I mean, I know SSHA1 was cracked recently yeah. um, by a, you know, brute force. Well, you know, nobody is, nobody is doing um, VoIP over SSH. It, that wouldn't be such a bad idea, probably. Um, it, would, it would probably work. But, um, you know, you could use other protocols. You could use, for example, IPsec, you know. But IPsec would be a bad choice because you can't tell it's there. It's too many layers deep. You can't, there's no API to tell you if it's running or not. Maybe the other guy's router doesn't have IPsec embedded in it. How would you know? Maybe he, his router broke and he went down to Fry's and bought a replacement router, which doesn't support IPsec. And you wouldn't know because, because your router doesn't have an API that tells your, you know, your network layer and your other layers all the way up to the application layer to put that little padlock on that says the voice is encrypted. It's the wrong layer. You need to be doing the encryption at the application layer or maybe right below the application layer so you could see that there's encryption going on. So you're saying it's better and more efficient to build it into the VoIP uh, standard that's being evolved? Yeah. OK. Got it. Um, now, you know, to your point about you know, somebody continuously imitating your voice, remember that the wiretapper doesn't want to get caught. It's really, really important for wiretappers to be able to do what they do without getting caught. And you know, if they do what you described, they're taking a big risk. You know, what if you had heard his voice at some time in the past? They don't know what parties you went to, what receptions you went to, at what conferences in Vienna, you know, or some kind of, you know, scenario where you might have heard their voice. Maybe you heard them on, on give a lecture over the internet, you know, or something. You heard their voice somewhere, you know. They would know that there's an element of risk of, uh, if you did recognize their voice and that, you know, that it wasn't their voice. I mean, they would be taking a big risk. I, you know, I don't think this is a, uh, a rich little, I call this the rich little attack, somebody imitating your voice. They don't know when you're going to, well, you, you say they don't even bother to imitate your voice. They just continuously... Well, those are two different attack situations. Yeah, two different, different attacks. Limits of when they're useful and when they're not useful. Yeah. Or, and how difficult they are. I think that uh, w what people usually ask me about is the rich little attack. Mm. You know, they imitate your voice when you're pronouncing the words, but when you're saying the uh, short authentication string. 
But as you said, this may be uh, spending too much time on one narrow subset of the problem. By the way, how much time do I have left? So you have until about 5.30, and there's a clock straight ahead. Okay. Oh, look at that. Yes, okay. Um, You could solve that more difficult problem, right, with the same problems you're going through with voting, right? But maybe do a DNA scan or a fingerprint scan when the guy connects. But I don't care to solve that problem. <laughs> I think that's a problem that, that in the real world we're not facing. It's not part of a, a threat model that, that I care to address. I think that what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to stop organized crime from uh, be, being able to listen to millions of people. And, and it, it, the organized crime is going to be attacking the Internet, excuse me, attacking VoIP the same way they're attacking the Internet today. Not the same way, with the same level of intensity, the same massive am amount of exploitation. Now, I could also say that I don't like governments spying on us. Um, but everybody knows I already stand for that. You know, it's kind of, it's, I'm typecast that way. I'm trying to say some new things here that people don't expect me to say. Um, and I'm trying to say that if we don't do anything about encrypting VoIP, that historically there's been a big differential in difficulty of wiretapping between governments wiretapping people and organized crime wiretapping people on the public switch telephone network. That asymmetry will collapse when we, when we migrate to VoIP. It will become as easy for criminals to do it as it is for the government to do it. And when that day comes, the criminals will be wiretapping judges and prosecutors. And then they're, they're going to listen to the details of ongoing criminal investigations. They're going to listen, they're going to learn the names of witnesses and, and informants. They're going to listen to prosecutors talking to their wives about what time to pick up their kids at school. We're talking about organized crime, violent criminals, drug cases, you know. What does that mean for the criminal justice system? How many, how many dead family members will it take to have a big impact on the entire country? So yes, I'll get to you in about 15 minutes or so when I stop <laughs> talking, okay? Uh, you know, look at, there's been 13 journalists murdered in Russia for criticizing Putin. Only 13 out of God knows how many journalists there are in Russia. I don't know how many. There must be, must be at least 100,000 journalists in Russia, right? So only 13. But look at the effects on the whole of journalism in Russia. They got the message. So imagine 13 incidents like that here. Now you could argue that... Um, the IT departments at the police department or the courthouse will be so good, they'll keep the spyware out of the computers. And I'm sure that there will be a lot of IT departments and a lot of police departments and a lot of courthouses that, in fact, will be so good. They will keep the spyware out of the PCs in that building. Most of them, even. We'll even grant most of them. But how many will it take for them to slip through? What if it's only a dozen? In the whole country, what if it's only a dozen? What will it do to the criminal justice system as a whole? We know that they will get through, and it will be more than a dozen. We have to encrypt void. We have no choice. But, Phil, one way to take that argument is to then say that maybe we shouldn't do void in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, but we should do it in the Vonage-type fashion, where the central providers can assure the security. I, you know, I, that's not the solution I want. That's not the solution you want. Yeah. But you have the argument you're using leads to that kind of. Well, that's true, and that's a reasonable point to raise. Uh, but you know, in the 1990s, they tried to build the Clipper chip, where they would keep a massive database of all the keys, so there would be centralized control of it. Uh, but here you have a different situation because you have the telcos on the side of doing VoIP in that way because the telcos don't want to lose their business. So the telcos really want to continue as central switches. Sure. So the telcos. But if you did, if you built up, let's take the Clipper chip model. Okay. If you built up a massive database of keys, that would be an attractive nuisance. Um, no, I'm, I'm suggesting something else. I'm suggesting build void. You know, just just make it very hard to do void through regulatory mechanisms, and that's certainly the way the FBI 
and the FCC is, is uh, hard to do VoIP. Put in the the enforce the regulations that came out the same day that the FCC put in the regulations about uh, uh, facilities based VoIP. You, that you, same day, they said no legal no applications can be attached to the publicly switched internet except those which are legally authorized. Nobody knows what legally authorized. Well, so what are you saying? Suppress VoIP? No. Uh, See, I actually think that, I mean, if we all just stay away from VoIP, then we'll be fine. Okay? Let's just do that. We could stay with PSTN. Keep the entire nation's phone calls on the public switch telephone network and simply just don't migrate. To don't migrate to VoIP at all. Or require them to be facility-based VoIP. Facility-based? Uh, facility-based means the, uh, the wire between you and the ISP is owned by the ISP. And right. The, yes. Well, okay, yeah, yeah. It's the... the yeah, no, I, I agree, internet. I agree. But, you know, if you think you can pull that off, then that's great. But I don't think you can, because look at what's happening here. VoIP is, is, is opportunistically taking root on whatever internet there is. <coughs> People have uh, Comcast cable at home, you know. They have all manner of IP. They have IP on, you know, cellular networks. They have it on DSL. They have it on Wi-Fi at Starbucks. They have it on uh, municipal Wi-Fi. They have IP is everywhere. IP is like water, and it, you know, it's it's like electricity. It's becoming ubiquitous. There's going to be IP everywhere, and VoIP is going to happen. It's a force of nature. We can't just say, well, we're not going to migrate to VoIP. No, I agree with you that VoIP is. A of nature. What I'm disagreeing with you on is whether the VoIP architecture is going to be genuinely peer, genuinely peer to peer. If it's genuinely peer to peer, the argument you're making. I think that um, that market forces will move VoIP in the direction of being peer to peer. I would and, love to see. And that. I'm not saying, and I don't think we even have the policy flexibility to make it be whatever any particular approach that we'd like to make it, because the so policy will emerge from the bottom. Let me go back to what you were talking about with how this works. And yeah. I, I just want to make sure you have enough time since there's about half an hour left. Yeah, yeah. Of the hour and 15 minutes. You had your hand up a little while ago. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to point out that uh, there is a technical fix for the kind of authentication that that lady wants. If your uh, telephone numbers include the fingerprint of a public key, uh, then you can send the public key as part of the handshake and authenticate the uh, different yeah. home of results at both ends. Sure. But I, I would rather not, for my architecture, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would rather not depend on persistent public keys. Your, your architecture is basically the scary architecture, Eric Blossom's cell phone. Actually, Eric Blossom did that architecture at the very precisely the same moment I was working on PGP phone. And Eric and I used to have meetings <laughs> and, and talk about what we were up to. And, uh, and so we traded ideas and we both so came out with our together. products at the same time. Him on uh, PSTN and me on internet. Actually, I was doing mine. The first version I did was also modem to modem, but then I switched to internet. But it was the same general ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this is related to the drawing you had on the board and what you were saying earlier about the asymmetry of the government versus uh, organized crime. If you made, uh, what I was reading when I was reading your blurb was saying that, oh, it's unfair that organized crime may have this, you know, unfair leverage. But let's say that, that you keep organized crime out of it, but now government says, I want to have that ability. I'm going to pass laws to make you. Yeah, sure. Here's what will happen. If the government passes the laws like you said, right. they will make it so that the organized crime can wiretap everyone. If they say we're not allowed to encrypt our, our VoIP, yeah. then if we don't encrypt our VoIP, then the very same law enforcement community that, are, that would be lobbying for that kind of law would find themselves with dead informants, dead witnesses, and dead family members. Isn't there a third system, perhaps, of where you say, OK, you're using that uh, secure channel you've diagrammed, but then you have this where you plug in the G, X, and Y on your end, and that your recipient does the same thing? that a government would have a special program that they have to put another key for that reveals what you Yes, like this. yeah, you can do that. You can put back doors in. But then, you know, it becomes another attack point. Um, you know, cl the Clipper chip was uh, an attempt to do that in the 1990s. And uh, 
Uh, you know, Matt Blaze uh, published uh, ways to defeat the Clipper chip. It was to actually to defeat the encryption so that um, so that you could you know get rid of the backdoor. Um, but and also the underlying cipher was Skipjack was within two weeks after it was published. Adi Shamir had an attack on 31 of the 32 rounds. Okay, so we could use a better block cipher. But if you put a backdoor in, then it becomes a, an attack point. It people try to find how to get into that back door. And, you know, if you centralize control of the back door, well, how centralized can that control be? Um, you know, it becomes, and also, if you think of it only in terms of a perfectly, a perfectly good, trustworthy government, a United States government, you know, with a wise and, and just president, you know, <laughs> making all the decisions and, and judges, you know, deciding thoughtfully about whether or not we should wiretap this call. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we have a world to think of here. What about Bulgaria? You know, where organized crime pretty much owns the police. Uh, what about Georgia? I'm not talking about the state of Georgia. You know, what about Kazakhstan? You know, but with the fact that you mentioned these countries, isn't that related to the human problem, the psychology problem? Meaning, uh, this is an evolution of networks issue, partly because if you made it, you could you can design a way that's super safe, that even governments don't have backdoors. I mean, hackers are doing that all the time. They find a way that no one can tap them. You know, blah blah blah. Even on the public network or whatever. Um, but isn't it a human problem, or you know, the same problem we're having with like people getting onto MySpace and putting all their information out there? It's not safe to do that, but. You know, it's a new technology, it's cool, and people aren't thinking of, you know, because when it first came out, it was more like friendly users, right? Like IRC, everyone. Wait, wait, slow down, slow down. You're, okay. you're covering a lot of things here. What are you, focus on what, no, what, what, what are you to trying to, to what's your point? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go back to, yeah, yeah. I think you're trying to explain how your idea works. <coughs> the discussion of what if, maybe just okay. after you get a little more to You want to see how the idea works? Yes. Okay. I was trying to explain the protocol a long time ago. We want to see if we both have the same session key, and that's how we tell if there's a man in the middle. So we read a, a, a hash aloud and see if it matches. How many digits? Oh, I'm glad you asked the question. I was about to go into that, because that's actually a pretty interesting part of the problem. How many digits? Have you guys, have, you, have any of you ever been to a PGP key signing party? <laughs> Well, let me tell you, it's just the geekiest thing you can imagine. <laughs> you know, you get a room full of uh, uh, ultra uber geeks, and they, they compare their PGP key fingerprints, which are like, you know, 20 bytes long. And uh, they, uh, they all stand up and read out loud a bunch of hex digits. Or, you know, with the more advanced cases, they read those, the word list that we would made to make one word per byte, you know. And it's just incredibly inefficient, and it's really not a good way to do it, you know, uh, technically. But beyond that, it's just extremely geeky. And they're scheduled weeks in advance, you know. And it's really kind of the social thing. And there's lots of pocket protectors and, and you know, uh, propeller heads and all that. And, and it's wonderful. I mean, I've been to a couple of them, and I just, I just love it, you know. But, uh, but it's just an inefficient way to do it. Um, to have a bunch of people stand up and reading endless digits. Well, that's something scheduled weeks in advance so people can put up with it if it's only done once at a conference. But what if you had to do it once every phone call? It's a non-starter. We need a way to shorten that quite a bit. So what if you just wanted to compare the first byte of the hash, just to see if the first byte matches? Well, OK. So you think that means that there'd be one chance in 256 of the wiretapper getting it right, right? Well, the wiretapper's in the middle, you see. That's still up here? Good. You see, he's generating his G to the Z right here. And he sends it over here, and he sends it over here. And so what he could do is he could calculate 256 different G to the Zs. He could even do it in advance. And then he would calculate g to the xy or g to the xz or g to the yz, which he could not do in advance, but he would do this part of it in advance. He could do actually thousands of these. And, uh, and then in, you know, he'd have a, you remember the, the, the parallel 
multi-core processors, you know? So we'd have a bunch of multi-core processors. You could have a box that this big that could have a hell of a lot of CPUs in it. And he could generate a lot of these very, very fast. And so he could just pick one that has the same hash on this side as it does on this side, the first byte of the hash. Even if it's two bytes of hash, that's only 65,000. Oh, he'd only, he could generate 65,000 of these. You have a box like this with a whole bunch of processors. You can have a couple hundred processors in one. You could do 65,000 of these pretty easily. So he could trick us if we shorten the hash into something, you know, that ordinary people would be comfortable with. He'd be, he'd be able to defeat it. How can we stop that? Well, here's what we do. We want to make it so that he can't make those calculations. He can't, we want to make it so he can't find the match. The only way he can find that match is if he knows my g to the x and he knows your g to the y at the same time. So let's just fix it, the protocol so he doesn't know both of them at the same time. Instead of me sending you my g to the x, I'm going to hash g to the x and send you the hash. Really? When did that fall off? Does that mean the recording was bad for a long time? No. Okay. Okay. So he would he would commit to g to the x without sending the g to the x first. He would send the hash of g to the x. I would send you the hash of g to the x, and then you would send me your g to the y. After I get your g to the y, I send you my actual g to the x. You can then hash it and compare it to the hash I sent. If they match, of course they will match then we proceed with the rest of the protocol. The man in the middle doesn't simultaneously know g to the x and g to the y before he's forced to give his g to the z. So he only gets one guess, not several hundred or several thousand. He only gets one guess. It's either right or wrong. And so for a 16-bit hash, just the first, we just lop off the rest of the hash, we just display 16 bits. He's got one chance in 65,000 of getting it right. And you can display that as a code word. Yeah, two code words, eight bits each. We take a list of words, 256 different words. It's like the military alphabet. It's like the old days of telephony where the first two digits were corresponding words. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. So, you don't like it? No. no? I don't want a failure rate of one, over six, uh, one out of 65,000. I didn't say that's what I use. I said that's what would happen if you use 16 bits. Okay. And besides, remember, he's a passive wiretapper. He's trying to, well, not a passive, he's an active wiretapper. He's a wiretapper. He's trying not to get discovered. I mean, imagine if your job was to be the wiretapper. That's what you were getting paid to I'm do. I'm sitting in China doing it. Yeah. So I'm not going to get prosecuted afterwards. No, but if you get discovered, then, then the people you're wiretapping are going to know that somebody's trying to wiretap them. They already do. They are due. <laughs> <laughs> They're okay with it. All right, okay. So what if it's 20 bits? That's the one in a million. I mean, that's a lot of false. I mean, and that's not just one in a million, just one in a million chance. That's one in a million. There would be, be 999,000 failures where you would say, oh, my goodness, it doesn't match. You know? That would be like almost, you know, like almost every phone call <laughs> was having this mismatch. I mean, there would be a like, oh, we better do something, you know. <laughs> you know it's like every phone call is, you know, only one in a million phone call, it, it comes out right, you know. I'd worry more about the uh, number of distress codes that were ignored during World War II and um, saw spy operations. Yeah. And the human failures here that I would about the technical failure. Yeah. Uh, and actually, with Z-Phone, I was displaying them in base 32, and I used four digits. That's five bits each times four digits is 20 bits. So, so, so I think there's an intersection here between some minimum number that's considered adequately safe and some maximum number of digits or words or whatever that humans can do sure. in a way that's considered comfortable. You could do three words, and that's 24 bits. That's 16 million, one in 16 million chance of success. But you know, but you remember, I mean, if you just look at how wiretapping is done or how interception is done by, you know, government agencies, they're, they're trying not to be noticed. And the value of the information they collect from intercepts depends on the, on the targets not knowing you're doing the interception. If they knew, then they would just spend all their time talking about the weather. 
You know, you're, the reason why you care about listening to their communications is because you think they're talking about stuff you want to know. And they're simply not going to tell you that stuff. They're not going to talk about that stuff if they have a communications channel that not only might be wiretapped, but it's proven to them in no uncertain terms in with great mathematical precision that there is a man in the middle on each and every one of the calls, except one in a million that we're... You know, where it looks like he's not there, you know? I mean, it's not, it's not like they speculate. You know, you have paranoid people. You know, it's like somebody once said that if it ever became known, you know, like if we could open the FBI files and find out how many people were actually wiretapped in the 60s, you know, during the Vietnam War, the protesters, you know, Martin Luther King, all these high-profile guys that were people that were wiretapped. And it's been speculated that, you know, if the FBI files were open so that we actually discovered, really, who was wiretapped. There'd be a lot of disappointed people. <laughs> we just found they just aren't important enough to have wiretapped, you know. But it wouldn't be a matter of speculation. Your phone would be telling you, and with mathematical precision, that you are, in fact, being wiretapped, beyond any doubt. The numbers don't match. Think about what that would do to the phone conversations. So you say a couple of words like, Jackal, uh, you know, uh, plastic. Yeah. And that tells you to, to uh, 65, 1 in 65,000 that you're having yeah. secure. You have a conversation with a person. Yeah. That's right. How, I have a question. How vulnerable or how safe do you feel VoIP is versus PSTN right now? Like, in other words, how much do you really think this is going on currently with either crime or... I don't think VoIP has been targeted yet. It's not big enough. But you know, just a few years ago, just a few years ago, uh, nobody thought that the internet would get as bad as it is today. You know, I mean, there were some doomsayers that made some dire projections, but those doomsayers sound positively Pollyanna today. What about attack, uh, time shifted attack, where the eavesdropper, the government, has recorded the digital conversation both yeah. ways and then attacks it at their leisure. Uh, how well, they can't do an offline attack on the authentication string. They only get one chance to guess. It's got to be the right guess. And then if they, it's not the right guess, mm -hmm. it's too late. The only thing they could do instead is to, wire, is to uh, attack the Diffie-Hellman. Okay. To do that, they would have to compute discrete logarithms, or which is related mathematically to factoring. They'd have they to do... they got lots of time and lots of, and I say, lots of computer sure. power. But I'm using, right. I'm using 3,000 bit Diffie Hellman, which has got the same work factor roughly as uh, 2 to the 128th. It's, it's got the same work factor as AES 128, right. which is out of reach. Okay. Even with the best that the new uh, parallel machines can provide. <laughs> yeah. And supercomputers in the future, might. Even supercomputers in the future. What if you think about Moore's law, think about Moore's law. You know, quantum, with just a few. Quantum uh, computer. Yeah, yeah, quantum computers. Okay. <laughs> There'd have to be a lot of quantum computers because, I mean, think about what it took to crack the DES. You know, they did they did a DES crack. Deep, deep crack. You're talking about. Yeah, deep crack. Okay, it, massive parallelism. You know. Yeah. Um, you have to have a lot of processors. They'd all. There'd have to be a lot of quantum computers. Quantum what? You have to have a three thousand qubit quantum. Yeah. Our processors only have the work. But if you don't like that, we'll just make bigger keys. Yeah. You know, I mean, we'll just move to elliptic curves and, and you know, uh, you can just have bigger keys. AES-256. Z-Phone has AES-256 in it. And you could just use bigger Diffie-Hellman. Yeah. So I could buy one today from you? Go ahead to my website and download it right now. It's How do free. I get my bank to use one at the other end? Tell them you want them to encrypt their VoIP. <laughs> Tell them to call me. <laughs> and can we have a portable thing so that I can plug it into my cell phone or plug it into my home phone? Well, it would be in your cell phone. Uh, I thought when I started this project that I would go for some kind of boutique approach where I'd sell uh, you know, fantastically expensive uh, secure phones to people that are willing to pay fantastic prices for it. Yeah. uh-uh. Nobody to talk to. Yeah, nobody to talk to. Instead, I went for the horizontal market approach, infrastructure, IETF standards, you know. 
let's try to get this in the entire VoIP infrastructure. But if you got this out, you're going to piss off NSA and go in. Well, remember what I said about um, organized crime wiretapping us. Look, a few years ago, uh, people that made dire projections about the future of the Internet were not listened to. And their predictions are hopelessly optimistic compared to the terrible reality we face every day today in the Internet. Organized crime is attacking the Internet more ferociously than anyone imagined five, six years ago. The same thing's going to happen to VoIP. They're going to attack VoIP with the same intensity that they're attacking the rest of the Internet <coughs> right now. And, and if you don't think that, well, you know, people didn't believe what people predicted would happen a few years ago, and those predictions were actually not as I bad as the reality. In a way, the existence of these phones makes it more likely that somebody like the, the Russian mafia bad guys, who have a lot of technology and money and time, will want to crack this because it must be something good, otherwise people would pay a hundred bucks extra for a phone. It's got, it's got to be an appealing target, right? Yeah, but, you know, if they want to attack this and it's embedded in phones, you know. Let them, isn't good enough. Let them try. <laughs> yeah, the point Bring is, it on. Yeah, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, about what the hardware risks are? Obviously, you make the phone, you don't make all the components. Where are the risks on the hardware side of that? Well, on the hardware side, you could, you, you know, if we're all buying phones made in China. <laughs> you know, so well, can you I, describe the product a little well, more? Since everybody you? laughed, I don't even have to finish explaining that one. <laughs> and, and with operating systems, it, by it, Microsoft. When you say it plugs into your cell phone, what do you, is, it, is this an SD card? What is it you're actually selling? No, what, what, I'm, sell, what I'm selling, I'm selling an SDK that, that VoIP manufacturers could put into their products. Okay. So every, every phone would have this someday. In fact, I'm already making deals right now, and, you know, so it's, it's starting to appear. There's a... Um, but There's I've, even some open source version of it. Uh, that, that, that all assumes that Did you dismiss the hardware at risk? It's open, right? There's no secrets if, in the hardware, right? Well, there's no secrets in any of this, except for the transitory secrets that are made for each call. I guess, I guess I'm asking the question What are the hardware risks, knowing that hardware is made by lots of people? I don't know what the hardware risks are. Well, the risks are that some manufacturer will generate random numbers incompetently. They'll generate random numbers using a linear feedback shift register instead of, you know, proper entropy management with hash functions and block ciphers and, you know, running real cryptographically strong pseudo-random bit generators based on high entropy noise sources. What's the difference in cost between those two ways of generating? It's mostly just knowing the right way to do it. It's not that much. So Every phone has a microphone, you know, so you've got a rich source of entropy right there. Once you've got the entropy, it's easy to plug it into hash functions and block ciphers and mix it all up real good and distill the entropy down. High quality entropy from a low quality, you know, pink noise source. Yeah. Is it worth mentioning that open source and your gain internet standard, which loves, you know, open source, does that mean that your standard is already in the uh, Asterix project? Where they have the Funny you should say that, okay. because as we stand here now, there is a guy in India who is in the final stages of integrating this into Asterisk. Because that allows you to decentralize the telco. Yeah. yeah. The thing I'm worried about in the phone is, is not the hardware, it's the software. Yeah, the software. If you're running a, a phone, say, on a laptop Windows machine, you know. Even if it's in a telephone, I mean, just because they haven't attacked it yet doesn't mean <laughs> Have yeah, but if you if you have a phone that doesn't allow you to download um, new software on it except by pushing a button and getting a digitally signed download tarball, you know, then uh, you, you're probably going to be okay. Hardware is better. There's an incredible market for ringtones and games. And yeah, well, so don't get those. <laughs> if you wor worry about it, I'm not. I never buy ringtones. I'm still. I'm carrying around the same phone. My, my cell phone is the same phone that I bought the day I bought it. There's not a single bit of extra software running on this. No fancy ringtones. It comes with five or six ringtones. I just pick one of those. And, you know, if you're not, a ser if you're not serious about security, you know, go ahead and download all that stuff. And, you know, and just don't be talking about... The, the, the trend in cell phones is for more complicated software. 
if Microsoft is an example, it's going to be sure. Yes, yeah. to the extent that we move in that direction, it becomes vulnerable. As soon as they become general purpose computers that can download taking candy from strangers, you know, then you're going to get attacks. You're going to get this, just as much attacks on phones as you get on you know, other Windows machines. You might not be able to buy a cell phone that doesn't come with a web browser in it tomorrow afternoon. Well, so, you know, I mean, you get, you know, you're taking your chances. You do that. You, you know, I'm not going to do that, okay? For people that care about making secure phone calls, they can do it right. And if they want to take the risks doing it like what you're describing, they'll do it that way. And some of them will be attacked and some won't. And I don't care. <laughs> you know, if you want a secure phone, get it from me and I won't let you download stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. I'm, you know, I'm trying to be funny here. Uh, <laughs> I don't mean to sound like... Perhaps the issue is, is less a case of, uh, oh, gee, this has weaknesses. Like, that's a big surprise. Uh, there's a system that... The as a weakness. Yeah. And more one of, uh, in fact, trying to characterize those weaknesses uh, or, and the context in which the, the weaknesses are bigger or smaller. Um, and, and just sure. as you said, the weaknesses are in the execution the environment. Void, don't try to get the VoIP market to be centralized uh, with, with, through the telcos because, sorry, that, that, that ship has sailed. Similarly, the, the one about the what what's in phones now is that they're already having all of the flexibility of a general purpose computer. Yeah. And that ship has sailed. And, and that doesn't make your stuff useless. It merely says there are some constraints and that may actually lead to some classes of products which are sold for the purpose of use by people who want safer environments. And it doesn't make the other environment useless. It just makes it less useful. Yeah. Now, I've been watching you for the past few minutes and I can tell that you're not really happy with the way this is going. Um, yeah, but I have a whole bunch of issues. <laughs> um, I think you're not thinking hard enough about the market and I'll do the embarrassing thing of saying, you know I've been doing this stuff for 15 years now, but there's my daughter a freshman <laughs> And by God, she didn't put the firewall on that UChicago gave her to do because some kid told her it was going to slow down some application. Sure. And this is the daughter of a security geek. Yeah. Yeah, I you know. know. So. I can't solve all the problems. Right. You know? Your execution environment can be attacked. And that's just the way it is. And it's not my fault. You know? Right. So I, well, my, job, my job is to do a good protocol. Right, no, I'm trying to do a good protocol. It doesn't matter how good I make that protocol. If you put that protocol on a platform that's sure. riddled with hostile sure. software sure. That's take, is, that has root that's access. The, the you current know. frown. The real frown is the frown I brought up earlier, which is my concern that the federal government may push us um, through, the, through the offices of law enforcement, not through the offices of, law, of national security, which seems to be on your side this time, our side this time, um, but through the offices of, of law enforcement towards a centralized VoIP model. And that's, that's my, my real concern. They tried that in the 90s, and it wasn't only because of the peculiarities of the Clipper and, you know, some sure. architectural yeah, no. specialized... It had a lot to do with Echelon. It, yeah, it had a lot to do with... Yeah, there's, a lot, there, there's just a lot of problems with trying to do it in a centrally controlled manner. And, and even if you think that the Clipper problems wouldn't apply, well, there would be some other problems. There's a lot of problems with trying to do it in a centralized way. And I think that, I think that the national security people, as you pointed out, the national security people, I think, are going to see that it's good to try to, if we're going to migrate from the PSTN to VoIP, we better encrypt this stuff. No, I'm seeing all sorts of evidence that they're seeing it. Yeah. I mean, they don't want the Chinese listening to defense contractors and, the, you know, all that stuff. It seems like a uh, centralized protocol has one major advantage, which is it doesn't require a change in user behavior. Uh, trying to get people to change the way they use Ah, uh, you know, I didn't people. really talk, I didn't really describe the whole protocol to you. I just focused entirely on the short authentication string. I forgot to mention, you guys like SSH? Everybody's used SSH, right? Well, I have some of the same features they do. I use key continuity. <coughs> in a manner not entirely unlike the way SSH does it. I don't use persistent keys, and SSH does use persistent keys. But I do something else. When you make the first phone call, 
like SSH, there is some key material that's cached. So that the second time and third time and so on, if the man in the middle wasn't there in the first call, he's locked out of the other calls that come later. That's like SSH. So typically, the wiretapping, you know, it's likely to happen at some later time because they don't become interested in wiretapping you until, you know, you're doing something later that they become interested in. So there's a fairly good chance that the wiretapper is not there in the first call. What I do is um, when I generate the session key, at the end of the call, I erase the session key. But before I erase it, I hash it. I store it in a cache. And every, every one of these phones has like a, a serial number. And you use that to index into the cache. When you get an incoming call, it uh, tells you uh, kind of a cache ID to index into the cache so that you can see in the cache, you look at the hash from the last call. And well, you hash it again, and you send the hash over and say, hey, do you have this shared secret from our last call? Yes or no, because it might have gotten lost or something. If it matches, then you say, aha, we can use it. So you do a Diffie-Hellman like you always do, but you hash in to the results. You know, you, you take the Diffie-Hellman result due to the XY, you hash that down into an AES key, but you mix with that hash a hash from the earlier call. And then at the end of this call, you do the same thing again. You know, you, before you erase everything, you hash it again, store that in the cache to replace the old one, and then ripple it forward in time. So that means that ordinary people, from a human factor standpoint, they don't have to ever check the, the, uh, the short authentication string. They don't have to do it the first time? They don't have to do it ever. Because, because if you accept the idea that probably there wasn't a man in the middle on the first call. But wait, maybe you don't like that. So suppose you and I talk on the phone 100 times over the course of a year. Every three days or so, we talk on the phone. And we talk about the weather and all kinds of nonsense that doesn't matter. But on the 100th phone call, we talk about something we care about. So we say, hmm, today, let's check the short authentication string. And we check it, and it matches. So not only does that show there's no man in the middle in this call, but it retroactively proves there never was a man in the middle all the way back to the very first call a year ago. That's kind of a nice security feature. It gives us peace of mind, just in case we did talk about something sensitive a month ago and we just didn't think of it then. But you know, that probably is going to match because probably there isn't a man in the middle because probably there wasn't one in the first call and he knows he's missed his chance. He can't get in later. Of course, there's always that possibility that they won't match on a 100th call, phone call, which means that not only is there a man in the middle on this call, but there was a man in the middle on every one of the calls for the past year. <laughs> that would be a real oh shit moment. <laughs> but I don't think that's going to happen because, because it's actually very difficult for the man in the middle to be there on every one of those 100 calls. Because you might travel to Hong Kong and to Singapore and to Bucharest and to all these other places and you're in hotels and you're in local Wi-Fi networks and the media path is going to be different on every one of those cases and to do a classic man in the middle active attack on a hundred calls from all points around the world between two arbitrary points it becomes very hard so in realistic operational security I don't think you're going to I think this is a pretty secure way to do it. So, so, let me so I'm, t I'm doing a belt and suspenders approach. I've got the short authentication string, and I've got key continuity, kind of like SSH. So, so let me postulate that there's two kinds of traffic in the world. There's the stuff of daily privacy, and there's the stuff of very big time privacy. Mm -hmm. That what you're describing, including why it's tough to attack, uh, makes a whole lot of sense for the daily privacy. Which, by the way, I think is a really good thing. I mean, that's extremely useful, and it's convenient, which is a big win. Yeah. But that as soon as we move into the really big privacy, that the likelihood that we'll need some additional mechanisms at the beginning to, to do the kind of testing, and maybe, in fact, it's only as small as you said, which is to say those three digits, which is a, actually a large human factor change, but it's not an unbelievable... Yeah, but you don't have to do it much. You don't have to do it much, and in fact, more importantly, it's only special people 
people who had those very big secrets, which aren't a lot of people in the world. Yeah. Uh, that, that's just completely partitioned the human factors problem into, for very big payoff, you have a little bit of extra work for daily stuff where it's not as big a deal, you don't have any, any uh, human factors change at all. It sounds pretty good to me. So does that mean you like this protocol? It's <laughs> uh, <Mormon>. um, <laughs> Like most of these things, I think as long as the constraints around it are well enough understood, sure. that it's then, I'll say marketed. And I, I wasn't done. There's actually a third layer of defense. I like the fence and just what you've said so far. If if you really want really better privacy than daily privacy, you've got to secure your physical devices at all times and make sure when you're sleeping they're not being yeah. taken. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. this is plenty good yeah, enough. To make sure, unless you're doing that, this is good enough. Pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yes, <laughs> just call it that. <laughs> I What's really don't layer? like the Z phone name. Maybe I should. Ah, oh, it's too late. <laughs> What's the third layer? The third layer. Ah, well, funny you should ask. Um, <laughs> one more thing. <laughs> uh, that's what Steve Jobs does at his presentations, right? Like, one more thing. <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I didn't plan it as well as Steve Jobs, so my one more thing isn't that exciting. But, um, you know, there are some environments where you can actually use the signaling for things that, where you trust the signaling. I mean, I don't trust the signaling. I mean, if the f signaling is controlled by AT&T, because it's their SIP servers we're using, I don't trust it. I just don't. I've been reading too many articles in USA Today. So what about other environments where you can trust the signaling? Maybe a bank. What if there was a bank that had bank employees? And they were using VoIP, and the bank actually owned the SIP servers. It was the bank SIP servers, so they trust it. They have their own IT department, their own employees. It's in a room that they own. So they trust the signaling. And it's bank employees talking to other bank employees in their branch banks around the world or whatever. And so, but they're worried about their employees not being diligent and not checking those digits. Understandably, people often don't. So, you know, in the one usage scenario where you have individuals who don't trust the enterprise that controls the signaling, the scheme that I've already described works pretty good because you don't have to trust the signaling. You can just check those digits unilaterally and the signaling isn't even involved. The signaling doesn't even know you're even encrypting the call. But what about the inversion where the enterprise wants the call to be encrypted, but doesn't trust the individuals to do a good job in checking those digits because they're human and they don't care and they're not getting paid enough and they're not diligent, you know. <clears throat> well, all you have to do is send those digits through an authenticated channel. That doesn't have to be an encrypted channel, it just has to be an authenticated channel. Remember, these digits are not secret. They're hashed from things that are sent over the wire, so they're actually known to the attacker. But you want to make sure if they match, you could send it through an authenticated channel, perhaps the signaling. You know, SIP is supposed to have things in it that allow you to send authenticated information. I mean, one simple way is sometimes they have TLS backed by a public key infrastructure for the signaling. I'm not against, you know, I don't care what the signaling does. I'm not trying to, you know, I trust the phone company will get a phone call from point A to point B. My lack of trust of the phone company is not because I think they're going to misroute my call. My lack of trust is that I think that I can't trust them with the media encryption. You know? So if they have signaling that works and that it's authenticated, then we can send stuff through it without it being tampered with if they have a well-implemented authenticated channel for it. And if they do, we could send the short authentication string or the underlying hash that it was calculated from through that signaling in a SIP re-invite after the call has already started and established. And so the bank can do unilateral checking to see if there's a man in the middle through the signaling channel that they trust because they own it without relying on the due diligence of lazy bank employees that might not check the short authentication string. So you have a belt and suspenders approach where everyone gets what they want. 
where the distrustful population who doesn't want to trust AT&T can do their own unilateral checking. And the distrustful bank who doesn't trust the employees to do their due diligence can get what they want. Everybody can check it themselves through different methods. And so everyone gets what they want. So on that note, we need to go offline. But feel free to stick around and ask questions. Um, Zimmerman said he'd be available afterwards to chat for a bit. Sure. Thank you very much. For information on other Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.